Omen 3 The Final Conflict continues Damien Thorne's rise to power as the Antichrist. Now in full control of Thorn Industries and ambassador to Great Britain, just as Robert was, he's hunted down by seven priests armed with the daggers of Megiddo which were recovered from the ruins of the Thorn Museum. An alignment of stars from the Cassiopeia constellation signal the second coming of Christ, putting Damien in a race to find the Christ child while avoiding the assassins from the monastery. Good evening. My name's Evan, and welcome to Rockland Graves. I took a month off from Omen Reviews, but we're back in the swing of things now with the third entry in the franchise, written by Andrew Birkin and directed by Graham Baker. I love the first movie. I think it's one of the best religious horror movies out there and really stuck with me the first time I saw it. And while I thought the second movie was fine, I found it a little too stagnant and didn't enjoy how much time was spent on the characters catching up on information we've had since the first movie. I felt like Damien was too inactive in the story and things didn't progress nearly enough to make it feel like a proper follow-up to the original, ending largely in the same place the first movie did. I'm happy to say that while not perfect by any means, the final conflict is a lot more of what I was hoping for out of an Omen sequel, moving things forward and introducing some incredibly high stakes and it's got a few genuinely shocking moments. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, but all things considered, I was once again pleasantly surprised to find that this franchise hasn't yet fallen into the depths like some others have. Yet. I've been warned about the Omen 4 and I'm getting a little nervous to watch it, but that's for future me to worry about. Current me gets to talk about something that he actually liked, so let's take a closer look at Omen 3, The Final Conflict. We must ask God to grant us courage as we prepare to do battle with Satan and his son, the Antichrist. The opening of the movie shows the daggers of Megiddo being found and sold at an auction to a priest who brings them to the Subiaco Monastery where the disgraced Father Spoleto lived out his days after the fire in the hospital. One of the things that made Omen 3 work more for me than the second movie did is the through lines to the first movie. We visit familiar locations and the way the story is set up feels more directly connected to events from the original. And Returning to the Subiaco Monastery is one of the things that made that work. I didn't even really realize this until watching The Final Conflict, but Omen 2 was just really lacking in significant religious imagery and setting, which I think is part of the reason that movie felt a lot less significant. Omen 3 has some very striking imagery in it that feels a lot more in line with the grandiose nature of a story about the son of the devil and the second coming of Christ. Like, the ruins some of the priests try and bait Damien into later on. It looks fantastic and fits the themes of this story so well with the ancient structure and eerie landscapes and crashing thunder. I really enjoyed the tone of this movie from start to finish and I think a big part of that is the great location scouting. There's a lot of variety in the look of this movie but the visual styles never feel fragmented. It gets across that feeling of some ancient evil seeping into the everyday world by blending these grand eerie images with quaint city streets really well. We get these rolling English countrysides, borderline liminal flatlands, ancient ruins, a grand monastery, but also government rooms and suburban homes and astronomy towers. It's great. That's one of the things I've always found works best about the original movie. It's the way these religious sites bleed into the working world that really fits the theme of evil rising to power through politics and subtle control of the general population, which makes a very welcome return here. I don't know where to put this, so I'm just gonna throw it in here. I fucking love this bridge. I like this location. It's great. It's also a blessing that Jerry Goldsmith returned once again to score this movie since his work has been absolutely incredible since the first movie of evoking a sinister religious feel through the screaming strings. I regret that I didn't mention his work in my review for Omen 2 because the score in that movie was fantastic, so I'm making sure to mention it here. Goldsmith delivers some of the best and most original score to this franchise, and his involvement in these three movies goes a long way to making it feel like a cohesive trilogy. The look and feel of this movie as well as the score is a huge reason that I found it more enjoyable than the second, because the style here allows me to really feel the religious weight of what's actually going on. The original Exorcist, I think, is still the pinnacle of blending those everyday images with potent religious ones, but the first and third Omen movies are also really good examples examples of how this sort of thing should be handled. There will be one image that I'm going to want to talk about, but we'll save that for the end. Let's talk a bit about the plot first. 
Damien is now 33 years old, head of Thorn Industries and appointed ambassador to Great Britain just as his adoptive father was. One of my favorite touches is that part of Damien's focus since he's been in control of things is youth leadership and outreach, which is the perfect direction to point his character's focus. The Antichrist's rise to power is meant to lead to civilization turning in on itself, and having Damien weed his ideology into the world's youth by using his political power to get the population when they're young so he can mold them into the shape he wants for his design is such an unsettling idea. That's the sort of thing that I wanted explored after the first movie, and while the second had glimpses of that with Thorn Industries pivoting into agriculture, meaning that Damien would eventually have control of portions of the world's food supply, it felt more like set dressing. Here it feels like it has more meaning and makes Damien a more tangible threat. Damien is played by Sam Neill, who gives a really great performance as this man showing a soft-spoken, compassionate, and put-together person when he's in public, but switching seamlessly to a very dark, maniacal villain when he's showing his true colors. There's a lot of charisma in this performance, and while I'd personally prefer a more subtle approach to the writing of the character, I do appreciate that Omen 3 doesn't waste any time before allowing us to see Damien's true colors. And out of the angel isle he shall bring forth a deliverer. That was my issue with Omen 2, because when we know something the characters spend the whole movie figuring out, it feels like we're not at all involved, so Pivoting from that approach to one more focused on Damien being his full-on evil self was definitely the right move. From the start, it's clear that his true identity isn't a complete secret, and he has others in the political world helping him work towards that ultimate goal. There's a great sequence where he makes his way to a very secluded spot in the middle of the night, and we get shown this huge crowd of people who've all gathered here for him. Up to this point, it's a little unclear just how far his influence has spread, so I love how they just slap you in the face with this sea of followers all dressed in everyday attire. Some in nurses' uniforms, some children in scouts' uniforms, and everyone dressing the way they would while they walk the street among others. That was a great way to make his influence really feel like it's seeped into society and is brewing all around, despite the apparent normality of it all. That revelation that he's got this many people behind him packed a punch that I really appreciated. He meets a journalist early on in the movie and gets close with her son, and it's eventually revealed that he's weaseled his way into getting her son on his side by filling a fatherly role that wasn't present in his life. I love those details of snaking into the good in the world and twisting it to fit his desires. The other moment that really stuck with me is when he goes up to this room he's got on the upper floor of his house, which seems to be entirely dedicated to him mocking Jesus Christ through this statue of the crucifixion. It's a really intense sequence that felt like it was pushing a lot of boundaries, and even as someone who's not religious, it made me pretty uncomfortable in the best way possible. It's contrasted by us seeing him present that very well put together and successful man he shows on talk shows, then switching once he's on his own and gets to let loose. It's disturbing as all hell, it did a lot to make the character feel exactly as evil as he's meant to. That's one thing that I really appreciated about this movie. The shit that Damien does is truly and completely evil, and he does it with such callous disregard that fits thematically. Once the stars collide and the second coming of Christ is born, he puts in motion a plan to have every male child born within the time frame killed by his followers, which is what that meeting was about. Now, when that got brought up, I thought that surely their plan would be thwarted before the movie literally started killing newborn babies en masse. Nope. We get a sequence of Damien's followers going to the homes of these new parents and Although we don't see what happens, it sure as shit happens. There's even a priest who looks like he's about to drown a baby during its baptism. It's an absolutely insane sequence that I was not expecting at all, but it went a long way to show that this movie is not pulling any punches. It's unsettling to see how they talk about the progress of the plan playing out in the same tone they would any other business strategy, which is another way I think this movie does a great job at intertwining the political and satanic elements of the Antichrist story. Sefton Park, Liverpool, and the boy's name is Christopher. Not shocked enough yet by all of this? I'll give you one more. A mother gets put under Damien's influence by his hound and straight up fucking irons her baby to death. My brother and I were watching the movie together, and we just could not believe what we were watching unfold. You don't actually see it happen, but the implication was enough to have our jaws on the floor. Throughout the movie, the priests try multiple times to assassinate Damien, from climbing a TV studio set to try and jump on him with the dagger, only to become a pendulum of human kebab, to 
luring him into ancient ruins and attacking as soon as he enters only to learn that he tricked them and they killed one of their ilk. The movie's got a really steady pace to it owing to this great balance of tension achieved by having Damien try and hunt down the second coming of Christ before he reaches full power while the priests hunt him down to try and kill him before he finds the child. Pretty damn thrilling, and once the plan to wipe out all the babies comes into play, the stakes get raised tenfold and the whole thing just gets a lot of weight to it. While I found the second movie to be pretty stagnant and, and low stakes, albeit still quite entertaining, Omen 3 moves a lot and pushes things forward in a way that really kept my attention. There's just way more going on here. Now, that being said, while I appreciate the uptick in significant events that move the story along a lot more, where the movie still doesn't quite manage to hit the right notes is that none of the characters have much depth to them. We've got a lot going on here, and this movie is far more plot-driven than it is character-driven, and I would have wanted to see more of a balance between those two things so that the insane things that happen have more impact. It's crazy to see the sequence with the babies play out, and having Damien manipulate the journalist's son is an interesting play, but those things don't hit the same way they would if there was a little more work put into making you care about the characters. Damien's by far the most interesting, which shouldn't come as a surprise, but I would have liked a counterpart to him with a more developed personality than Kate, because that would have given the inherent stakes of what Damien's doing more impact. The result of this movie focusing entirely on plot is that it feels a little shallow at times, which doesn't quite feel right considering the nature of this story. The original made you really care about Robert through his panicked pursuit of answers and his conflictions about what it is he knew he had to do, but we don't really have any sort of character complexity here. They're mostly here as a vehicle for the story to play out through instead of having the story move as a natural progression from the characters and their choices. At the end of the day though, this wasn't something I honestly even noticed while I was watching the movie for the first time since I was enjoying the plot enough not to be too bothered by its characters being somewhat thin. It wasn't until after it ended and I started to think about the structure of the whole thing more that I realized where the somewhat shallow feel of the movie was coming from and why certain plot points didn't hit quite as hard as it felt like they should have. The convergence of all these different stories coming together was more than enough to keep me into the movie and just enjoying this race against time from two warring sides, but there is admittedly a bit of an underwhelming feeling to some of it because of what I was just talking about. It also helped that I liked the ending a fair bit, and if you can close off with a memorable scene then it goes a long way to gluing your story together and making it feel more complete, even if some of the other elements don't quite help get you there. Kate tells Damien that she knows where the Christ child is and makes a deal with him to release Peter if she shows him where to go, so she brings him to the ruins of an old church where she'd conspired with DiCarlo, the man who was leading the assassin priests. Assassin priests. I mean, come on, how cool is that? He tries to get the jump on Damien but isn't quick enough, and Damien uses Peter as a human shield. He proceeds on through the ruins and discovers that he's too late when he's met with an extremely memorable and grand sight of Jesus Reborn. I love this reveal so much, and it felt like it had all the weight the moment should, largely thanks to how beautifully ethereal the sight is. Nothing. Talking shit ain't getting you anywhere, Damien. He falls over, drained of his power now that Christ has been reincarnated, and the movie comes to a close with some Bible passages, closing things off nicely for this trilogy. I didn't hate The Omen 2 by any means, and I've, I've seen that it's a movie that a lot of people really do enjoy, which I totally get. It's fun and has great comfort movie vibes, but the third has so much more of that sort of thing that I'd hope to see out of an Omen sequel. It's not perfect, boasting some pretty cheesy writing and not having quite enough character depth to make it hit with all its force, but it's still a fun and entertaining movie thanks to its exciting plot and good pacing. It's definitely still more of a candy flick than the first movie, but it's far from being a terrible watch and has a lot to offer. Damien's a great villain here with an awesome performance behind him, there are some elaborate death scenes that feel right in line with the sort of thing we've come to expect from these movies, and it closes off in a very memorable way with this corporeal light of Jesus standing victoriously over Damien. I had a pretty good time with it. I still think that the original movie works best on its own, but as far as necessitated sequels to successful horror movies go, you can do a lot worse than The Final Conflict. I've heard the same cannot be said for the fourth movie, which we'll be taking a look at in a little bit, but before that, we're gonna be taking a look at Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey, which I missed last year, I never saw it, I just saw it for the first time, and with the second one coming out, I figured it was time to make a video about it. We'll save that for next week. Until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.